uh, from uh, John's Gospel. I've been working on it all week, here's the proof, I brought it with me. And then at 7.30 this morning I heard the news and I kind of lost faith for that message. Uh, and uh, just in case any of you are here this morning and haven't been following the news, that uh, it's just that Iran uh, launched some 300 uh, drones, ballistic missiles and cruise missiles at Israel uh, last night and uh, uh, just about all of them were actually destroyed. But uh, immediately I heard that, I thought, is this an event that's going to change the world? Um, because... Uh, I'm not going to make any political opinion, but just to state uh, the reality that uh, Israel has already said it will respond. If Israel responds, then Iran is likely to respond again, and, you know, where's it going to go? Uh, and also we know that Israel has undeclared nuclear weapons, so you always have that at the back of your mind as well. Uh, and so I think we've got, we've got kind of used uh, slightly to the whole... Uh, Gaza-Israel war. I don't mean we treat it lightly, but it's been going on for six months, is it now? And we kind of almost got a bit used to it. We're aware of the uh, terrors of October the 7th and uh, the ongoing horrors of uh, what's happening in Gaza. But in a sense, we've been living with it a bit now. Uh, and I think that this is a bit of a wake up. We realise that we could be into a different dimension altogether. Uh, that if this escalates, this could be incredibly serious. And we know it's not the only crisis. I mean, have we ever lived through a more dangerous time since the Second World War? So Ukraine and, Ru Ukraine and Russia continues. We know that's uh, at a very critical stage. And then there's always China in the background. Are they going to invade Taiwan? When are they going to close the South China Sea? Which I'm sure that they intend to do at some point. And uh, then you've got North Korea forever d developing more and more nuclear weapons, talking about striking South Korea at some point, and even America. And so it goes on and on and on. And we're living in a highly dangerous time. And uh, I just felt that when I heard about this uh, this morning, uh, what has happened overnight, that what I would actually want to do is to speak about the hope that we have. And the hope that we have is primarily in the return of Jesus Christ. And so there's a verse in, in Titus that uh, I'm just going to refer to and may refer to on a, on a number of occasions. And I, I this morning just pulled some notes I have off the computer. I've come here in a way unprepared, although I've been looking at this uh, material and the subject for uh, decades of my life. So in a sense I'm prepared, but uh, not in a particularly formal way. But in Titus 2... And in verse 13, this is one of the great verses on the second coming of Christ. We wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And we are a people of hope. And uh, I don't think there's a great deal of hope in the world at the moment. I'm not saying there's no hope at all. I think most hope is a resi resigned kind of hope. You know, people hope for the best. Uh, but we, we live as people of hope with the belief that one day Jesus Christ is coming again with majesty, power and glory. Now, a number of places I could obviously read from, but I'm going to uh, just read through some verses from Matthew chapter 24, and then I'll make some comments on the re return of Christ, which I hope will be helpful and faith-building and hope-bringing uh, for this time. So in Matthew 24, at the beginning of the chapter, we read, Jesus left the temple and was walking away with his disciples was when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. And as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the, a the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Just important to notice there that the disciples, without realising it, actually um, asked, Christ, asked Christ two separate things. Uh, what is going to happen with regard to Jerusalem uh, and that was fulfilled in AD 70 in terms of what Jesus was speaking about. But the disciples, without any sense of what might happen in the long-term future, also asked him, well, what's going to be the sign of your coming again and the end of the age? I mean, they probably thought of the two things as together. But of course, we know that they've been separated by now some 2,000 years of history. And so Jesus is dealing uh, with both of these questions. And so in a way, 
Matthew 24 actually kind of overlaps between the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and what comes at the very end of the age, which is yet to come. And so it takes some working out, Matthew 24. Uh, but Jesus goes on and says, uh, uh, as he's on the Mount of Olives and uh, he's speaking to the disciples, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumours of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And all these things are the beginning of the earth pangs, birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm uh, to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And so when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand and let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath for then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days have not been cut short, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you in advance." So if anyone tells you that there he is out in the desert, do not go out, or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And it was an encouragement to me, having made the switch of my thinking, that the first line of one of our songs this morning was, He's coming on the clouds. Uh, so I felt I'm on, on the, the right track here. Now, let me... Uh, say that I think generally speaking I have discovered anecdotally that there's not a huge amount of preaching on the second coming that takes places in evangelical churches these days. Uh, I, I know this because I have taught on the end times a lot over the years to leadership groups and whenever I do I say uh, when did you last hear a message on the second coming in your church and group after group after group I found there's been absolutely no response. Now I'm not saying nobody's preaching it but I'm and it never happens but it seems to me that there is a diminished uh, uh, attention given to this subject in recent years compared to what it was years ago. Uh, and I think a number of reasons possibly for that, I'll just mention a few, <clears throat> I think uh, there's perhaps a certain weariness that set in. I can remember years ago, very much the, the standard form of preaching about the second coming was this, if Jesus came tonight, would you be ready? And that was said again and again. And to be honest, uh, when Jesus didn't come tonight, there's only so many times you can keep on saying that before I think people get weary. Uh, and uh, I think we need to give more emphasis to the fact that this is still a day of grace in which people can repent and be saved, but Jesus is one day going to return. I think another reason that it may not be preached about so much today is because the business of life today kind of consumes people. We've got to get on with our lives and there's all sorts of things going on in life today. And that's true even of the church. I think within our type of church, uh, especially some years ago, there was a feeling very strongly that we've got to get the church right. 
um, because uh, it says in Ephesians that uh, uh, Christ will present to himself a radiant bride. And that's the church. The church doesn't look radiant at the present time, so we've got to work hard to get the church radiant enough for Jesus to return. I think there's a weakness in that theology, and it's this, that when we are saved individually, we are saved absolutely, and as soon as we die, we're in the presence of Jesus because we are his people. Uh, and so it's not a question that we've got to get to a certain level of holiness in order that we can make ourselves right to get into the presence of God. We are saved, and we are saved for eternity. Now, having been saved, it is right that we strive for holiness. And if you take the bridal imagery, I put it like this, that if there's a wedding going to take place, and you've got a young man and a young woman who are desperately in love with one another, I guarantee that if the, if the bride turned up on her wedding day in ripped jeans and a t-shirt, that uh, the man that she wants to marry would still marry her because he loves her, he's accepted her, he'd want to marry her even if she looked a bit scruffy. But the fact that she is loved and accepted means this, that on her wedding day, she does absolutely everything to look as beautiful as possible. And my friends, that's true also of the church, that uh, if Jesus turned up today, even though, to be honest, we might still look rather scruffy, that we will be fully accepted, because we are accepted. We are loved by the Lord Jesus Christ. But still, in this present time, we want to seek to be better for Jesus Christ than we are now. So it's right that we give attention to build our churches. And I think we kind of got into a, a frame of mind that said, well, we've, we've got to get the church radiant enough for Jesus to return. And uh, we kind of got busy with the, the church today and we began to lose the concept of the return of Jesus. I think another reason that we haven't uh, preached it so much in recent years is because for some people it just seems so jolly complicated. And you start talking about the second coming and we start talking about raptures and we start talking about millenniums and thousands of years and, uh, and uh, kind of think, oh dear, where's all this going? And people think they can't get their mind around it. And so then we say, well, actually, all you need to do is to listen to Jesus who said, I'm coming soon, keep it simple. But then you've got another problem and that Jesus doesn't come soon. Uh, and then you find that in 1 Peter, uh, Peter is teaching us that, uh, in fact, what we've got to do is to remember that God is a God who's on flexi time. It's not on our sort of time. Uh, and so the, the day of the Lord and the return of Christ might seem slow to us, but it doesn't seem slow to God. And one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. We've just got to accept that God's time is not the same as our time. And so we're coping with all these kind of things. Uh, and I think it's probably uh, led to a, a diminution of preaching on the second coming. But boy, do we need at the present time to recognise that we have this glorious hope, even the appearing of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So let me, uh, uh, this morning, just share a number of things with you about the second coming, about which all evangelical Christians believe. And I say evangelical because the word evangelical means that you believe the Bible. All right, so if you're a Bible-believing Christian, if you believe that this is the Word of God, uh, there are a number of things about the second coming which we as believers agree on. Now, there are things about the second coming of Jesus Christ on which there can be some disagreement. Uh, and I'm not going to touch those here uh, this morning because I want you to like me. I want to go in peace at the close of the message. But I, I am going to share with you those things absolutely that all Bible-believing Christians uh, do receive as the truth concerning the return of Jesus Christ. And let this build hope and faith in you at this very uh, difficult time in world history. So the first thing I would say that all evangelical Christians agree on is this, that Jesus will come again. Simple as that. He will come again. And that's stated about 320 times in the Bible. Something over perhaps 300 times in the New Testament, but across the Bible as a whole, about 320 times. It's been calculated that one in 30 verses of the Bible have some reference to the second coming of Christ. And also it's been calculated that there are eight times more prophecies on the second coming of Christ than there were given of the first coming of Christ. So we see this running right through the Bible. If you believe the Bible, you believe that Jesus is coming again. And certainly as you come to the New Testament, you see it running through the books of the New Testament uh, from Matthew to Revelation. 
Now, the earliest reference to the return of Jesus Christ, surprisingly, is in the last but one book of the New Testament, in the prophecy of Jude. Because if you go to Jude and verse 14 and 15, we read this, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them, See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of all the ungodly acts that they have committed in their ungodliness. And so uh, there's this uh, promise that the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones. And Enoch, who's a seventh in line from Adam, was the one who brought that particular prophecy. So historically, this is the oldest statement on the second coming that we have in the Bible. Now, you'll not find that prophecy anywhere else in the Old Testament. Uh, what it is, is it's a, a pro prophecy that's come down through Jewish tradition and literature but it's being included here in the New Testament. And so in terms of chronology, it's the oldest reference that we have to the return of Christ. When it comes to uh, the last reference that we have to the return of Christ, you've simply got to go to the end of the book of Revelation. And in Revelation 22:20, 20, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. So uh, as... Christian believers, what we are sure about is that Jesus will come again. You look through every gospel, it says that Jesus will come again. In the Acts of the Apostles, there's the reference to Jesus coming again, even as Jesus ascends into heaven. As you go through the letters of Paul, except with reference to Galatians, which was a, a book written particularly to deal with legalism, you've actually got reference after reference to the return of Jesus Christ. You go to the book of Hebrews, and it speaks about the return of Jesus Christ. You go to the writings of John and Peter, and then, of course, especially the book of Revelation, and you've got reference to the return of Jesus Christ. So the New Testament is shot through with verses and descriptions and references to the fact that Jesus Christ will come again. On this point, we are totally and absolutely agreed, Jesus will return. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Now, another thing that we agreed on is that Jesus will come in majesty and glory. And that needs to be compared to his first coming or contrasted to his first coming. Because you'll remember that when Jesus came first of all, it was a pretty quiet affair, really. It happened uh, in, a, in, a, in a small town in Israel, and uh, certainly the angels alerted to the, sh the shepherds to the fact that the Messiah had been born, and of course wise men turned up at some point as well. But it was uh, altogether quite a quiet affair, the first coming of Jesus. Not so the return of Jesus. And so you go to 2 Thessalonians 1.10, and what we read is this, that on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. So this is the description of the return of Christ or the day that he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at amongst all those who believe. It's a lovely uh, uh, kind of comment on this in a way, in a slightly obscure way, but in the book of Hebrews. Uh, if you go to uh, Hebrews, you will read of the accounts of the high priest going into the uh, Holy of Holies one day a year on the Day of Atonement. And uh, it's described from Hebrews chapter 9, I'll pick up at verse uh, 24 or 23, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Then uh, a reference to uh, the Day of Atonement. For Christ did not enter into a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered into heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. 
just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Now, when you get the picture here that is being drawn by the writer to the Hebrews, the high priest of Israel in the Old Testament age used to go into the Holy of Holies just on one day of the year on the Day of Atonement. He would go in twice, he would take uh, blood, that was to uh, be offered as a sacrifice for the sins of him, him and his family. And this blood would be uh, scattered, sprinkled around the Ark of the Covenant. But then he would come out uh, from the Holy of Holies and go back in uh, with blood again. And this was the blood that was actually to be offered for the cleansing of the people of Israel and for the, the, the 12 tribes. And you'll remember that this used to happen just one day of the year on the Day of Atonement. So let me say in brackets, by the way, he was not wearing a rope around his ankle to pull him out if he died there. That's evangelical mythology. That is not Bible-believing Christian. Uh, you will not find that in the Word of God at all. It's mythology. Uh, and so he would go in and he would offer uh, blood in, uh, as a sacrifice for the sins of the people. Now, you may have a, a picture of that almost as though it was kind of like some standard church service, that there was the priest and uh, the congregation would gather and it was all very reverent and kind of quiet and the priest would go in and he would do his thing with the blood and, and come out again. You need to understand it was an altogether different atmosphere to that particularly if you think of the 12 tribes of Israel in the, the wilderness, and this happened in the tabernacle that had, had been built in the wilderness, and they would all gather around the tabernacle on the Day of Atonement, and when the high priest came to do his uh, sacrificial duty, he would be uh, covered with gorgeous robes, and he would be wearing the names of the 12 tribes of Israel on stones that were attached to a breastplate. And he would go into the Holy of Holies and at that point there would be nervousness, anticipation. Would he come out again because would his sacrifice for the people actually be accepted? And so there was this kind of building of tension. This wasn't a kind of quiet, sedate affair. They were on tiptoe. Was their high priest going to come out again? Would God accept the sacrifice for their sin once again? And he would come out of the uh, Holy of Holies, and as he did so, the people would crowd around him. And there are mentions of this in Jewish writings about the excitement of the people as they are crowded around their high priest, and even references to the fact that how marvellous he looked, having been before God in the Holy of Holies. The, the sacrifice was accepted and he'd come out amongst his people again. And that's the picture that Hebrews is painting. But actually he's saying that Christ went into the heavenly tabernacle uh, and Jesus Christ will come out again from the, the heavenly tabernacle. He's coming back a second time. But it won't be repeated year in, year out, like the high priestly visit into the, uh, uh, on the Day of Atonement, because, of course, the sacrifice of the Day of Atonement only covered that year's sins. But when Jesus offered up his own blood, as it were, in the heavenly tabernacle, that was accepted for all our sins for all time. Hallelujah. Nevertheless, Jesus will come out a second time. And he'll come out in order to receive the worship and the admiration and the praise of his holy people. And that's why Paul in uh, Thessalonians, which I also just read, in 1 Thessalonians, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10 says this, Listen, they will be punished with everlasting destruction, shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might, on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. That will be Jesus on his return, that he will be marveled at and glorified amongst all who believe. So when Jesus came first, just a few shepherds, but when he comes again, all his people will marvel at him and glorify him for his sacrifice for our sin. So he's coming back in majesty and glory. The next thing we all agree on is that his return will affect everything. And I do mean everything. When Jesus returns, everything will be affected. 
everybody will be affected. You get that in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12. And here the uh, writer John makes this comment. He says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And so that verse is one of the most sober verses in the whole of the Bible. John says, I saw the judgment seat of Christ, and before the judgment seat of Christ, I saw all the dead, great and small. Everyone, everybody will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And uh, it doesn't matter if you're an American president, an Iranian dictator, uh, if you are uh, an orphan boy in some African country who's never known any money, any wealth, uh, even good health. It doesn't matter if you're rich, poor, it doesn't matter if you are regarded as great or regarded as nothing, everybody will be there. All right. Biden will be there. The Ayatollah will be there. And Joe Bloggs next door to you, he'll be there and you'll be there and I'll be there. And we'll all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. For those who are not believers, that will be their final judgment. They will be cast out from God's presence forever. For those of us who are believers, there will be a judgment or an assessment of the way that we have lived our lives as Christians and we will gain rewards accordingly. That's another subject I can't get into. But everybody will uh, be affected when Jesus returns. The church will be affected. So everybody is affected and the church is affected. Again, if you go to Revelation chapter 19, and verse 7, this is what we read about the church. And we've got some glorious verses here where we read, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. So when Jesus returns, the church is joined to Jesus as his bride and eats the wedding supper of the Lamb, which will be the beginning of a celebration that will last forever and ever. And in fact... All creation will also be affected because if you go to Revelation 21 and verse 1, this is what we read. John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And so there's John saying, I have seen all biblical prophecy fulfilled. Everything that the Bible has prophesied would happen, I have seen fulfilled and actually happen. And when Jesus comes again, there is a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth. The whole universe will be regenerated and Jesus the King will live and reign with his church forever and ever. And so you have these, uh, as it were, great climax, great climatic events that are all uh, there with the, are associated with the return of Jesus Christ. That when Jesus Christ returns, everything will be affected. Everybody will be affected. The church will be affected. Creation will be affected when Jesus comes again. There's also the issue of the time of Christ's return. That is also something which is agreed by all believing Christians. So if you go to Mark 13 and verse 32, what we read there is uh, a clear statement on that. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, not the Son, but only the Father. And so that's in the context of the return of Christ. Or that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So we are agreed that we don't know when Jesus is going to come again. Unfortunately, across the course of church history, there have been one or two maverick individuals, more than one or two to be honest, a few maverick individuals who reckon they could work it out. And so some people have, have tried to give us a date. So a friend of the great reformer Martin Luther worked out that Jesus would return at 8 o'clock on October the 19th, 1533. We seem to have missed that one, okay? That was right back uh, 500 years ago. I have a book here. I have all sorts of kind of uh, last uh, end times paraphernalia in my study. And here's one of my books, The Appointed Times, by somebody called Randy Bullock. No comments, but only an American could have a name like that. And he has worked it out from the book of Daniel. 
And he says, listen, because this could be important, the rapture will take place on May the 14th, 1997. We seem to have missed that one as well. And I remember years ago a very famous book that came out, it was famous at least for five minutes, which was uh, a book written entitled 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 1988. There was a rumour that he wanted to revise it the next year, make it 89 reasons why Jesus will return, uh, but uh, that was uh, not accepted by the publishers. So there are the occasional mavericks who have tried to speculate on the, the date of Christ's return, but actually the Bible is clear, we don't know when Christ will return. And in the midst of this crisis that we're going through at the present time, I'm not saying to you that I know that Jesus will return almost immediately because of this crisis, but I'm also not saying I know he won't. All right, we need to be aware that actually Christ is going to return. And we need to live, look to that with faith and with hope. Um, let me just say that with regard to that, I think that there are a few things that we ought to be practical about. One is, in light of the fact that Christ is going to return, we need to think about our life. And so in 1 John 3, uh, we've got a very helpful reference to that. 1 John 3 and verses uh, 2 and 3. And here uh, the writer is saying, Dear friends, now we are children of God. That's what we are at the present time. If you're a believer, you're right now a child of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Now, there's again a clear reference to the fact that Jesus is going to return and that when he returns, we should be transformed into his likeness. That's a consistent teaching throughout the New Testament. The response to that, says John, is that all of us who have this hope purify themselves, even as he is pure. And my friends, I think that we are uh, very accustomed to hearing great teaching on the message of grace and the fact that by God's grace we are who we are. We are the children of God. We are saved by grace. We are held uh, by grace. And because of the grace of God that has come to us, that should make us grateful. And we should want to live a life that's worthy of Jesus because of his grace extended to us. But John Piper helpfully points out that the Bible also motivates us by future grace. Because there's a grace that is yet to come, which is when Jesus returns in order to transform our bodies into his own likeness. And so what John is saying here is all that have this hope in him, that the hope of Jesus' return and what that will mean, purify themselves just as he is pure. And as we look in anticipation to future grace, to the fact that Jesus will return and transform us into his likeness, that is a motivation for us to live pure and holy lives at the present time. It also means, I would suggest to you, that we should look forward to the future. And uh, for that, you can go to a verse like 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8. And Paul so often speaking about the return of Christ, but in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8, uh, he says this, uh, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award, to me on, will award to me on that day, speaking of the day of Christ's return, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. My friends, we as believers might have great hopes for the church, we might have great ambitions for our lives. What I would urge upon you most of all and above everything else is that you long for the appearing of Jesus. And at this time, where the world is so uncertain, and you think of uh, the power of Russia and what that could mean, you think of what's developing in the Middle East, and you know, has the world changed last night, and you think of the threat from Korea, and the ominous growing threat from China, and that's only touching the surface of things that's going on around the world at the present time. If there's one people that should be longing for the future, it should be us, that we should be longing for the return of Jesus Christ. And when he comes again to receive that crown of righteousness, 
because we have been living our lives in him and for him. And then also, I think, practically at the present time, we should live in the hope that the best is yet to be. And I, I go back again to this favourite verse of mine in Titus, in Titus 2 and verse 13, where we, where we do read that so we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. My friends, it's not always going to be like this. We are living with a hope. There's not always going to be war and rumours of war. We're living with the hope that there's going to be a fundamental change, that when Jesus comes again, we shall be raised up in new bodies, transformed into his likeness. The whole of creation will be transformed to reflect the glory of God. We shall reign with Jesus forever and ever. We shall look upon the face of God. However much you might enjoy life now, and I urge you not to despise life now, because God gives us everything richly to enjoy at the present time, but it is as nothing compared with the future hope that we have when Jesus is going to return in majesty, grace, power and glory. Jesus is coming again, and we should live with the hope that in the present disastrous situation we can find ourselves with world events the best is yet to be. As I suspected, I'm running right out of time. There's so much I could share with you. I'm just going to fire some verses at you. Be, be blessed by these verses. Acts 1.11 The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven, he will come back in the same way as you've seen him go into heaven. 1 Corinthians 15.22 So in Christ all will be made alive, but each in turn... Christ the first fruits, and when he comes, those who belong to him. Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4.16, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. 2 Timothy 4.8, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Hebrews 9.28, so Christ suffered once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. 2 Peter 3.10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. 1 John 3.2, we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Jude 14, see the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones. Revelation 22.2, Jesus says, yes, I am coming soon. And the church responds and says, amen, come Lord Jesus. This is our sure and certain hope. Amen? Amen. Jesus is coming again.